Okay. Um, hi. I'm uh, Leonard Pettering, and I'm going to do a talk today um, together with Kai, who um, hid there in the first row. Um, we're the guys behind Systemd, or at least two guys behind Systemd. And uh, yeah, the, the, the topic of the talk is going to be um, like um, the thoughts that we have made ourselves about um, why Debian should or should not adopt Systemd as a default. Of course, it's not really our decision, and uh, we are, after all, Fedora guys ourselves. But of course, we are always interested in a in, uh, healthy community and, and uh, cooperating with everybody else. So yeah, the first part of the talk is going to be about the why, and the um, uh, second part of about the talk is going to be about the why not. And yeah, we have a lot of ground to cover, but still, if you guys have any questions, I would really prefer if we could make this interactive and you ask them right away. In the worst case, I might just say, let's just cut that particular thing um, later, but um, hopefully we can more make this more interactive than just me talking and you guys listening. So, um, yeah, let's get started with the why. Um, oh, by the way, I know I tend to speak quite slow if it's too, uh, uh, quite fast. If it's too fast for anybody, just tell me and I'll try to be slower. Okay, so the why. Let's uh, first start with a little bit about the superficialities of, of the project. <laughs> It is, a, it is a very healthy open source project, we believe. It has a very large community. If you look at the statistics, we have 641 mailing list members, 424 Git contributors. Of those, 241 were already from UDEF. Um, of course, you cannot just, sub if you're just interested in the ones that are only committed to system, you cannot just um, subtract the 241 from the 424 because there are quite a few who contributed to both. We have 17 different Git committers from a couple of different companies. Um, we have uh, uh, 253 committers or s 30 contributors per month. Of course, um, the 17 Git committers, um, like uh, there's no denying most of the stuff that's done is done by K me and by Kai and by Spigniew and by Michal and a couple of others. Um, most of them work for Red Hat with some exceptions. Um, but actually, among those 17 Git committers, we even have people from Canonical. We have people from, from Intel. I don't think the Canonical people actually realize that they have commit access to systemd. They're committing to UDEF either. Hmm? They're committing to UDEF. I don't know if they're committing to systemd. Well, it's a systemd part. Anyway, but you guys have commit access to everything, in theory. Anyway. Um, so yeah, I think if you if you read it from that, it's, it's a very healthy project. I leave it to you to figure out how that compares to that other uh, a competitor. We have no CLA, no copyright assignment. We just the real open source project. We are LGPL three uh, two plus, basically like we don't want to have anything to do with politics, so we choose something that everybody can agree on, and that is while still copyleft, the most liberal form of copyleft. Um, it's inherently cross distribution. Um, we have, uh, of course, a lot of people from Fedora working on it, but the Arc Linux people have adopted it, so it has a lot of support for that. There are some patches coming from the Debian people, from the SUSE people who have adopted it as well. Um, Everybody is on board and, and tries to pull into one direction. And of course, as mentioned, there are multiple vendors, like um, you have Red Hat behind it, SUSE behind it, you have Intel behind it, you have um, quite a few other companies, you have a lot of embedded companies, you have the car companies, um, there's a lot of, um, of uh, commercial power behind it. And everybody's welcome, and we mean that, right? Like we will, if you send us a patch, we will consider it. In the worst case, you will get an explanation why not, but usually we'll try to, to um, accommodate for your needs. And we use Git actually for our co uh, community stuff, so we try to be like how an open source project should be, just the thing that you can contribute to without thinking because everybody knows Git anyway. Yeah, we do like community a lot. We have multiple hackfests per year, and we try to get everybody to attend. That uh, sometimes even includes um, that we um, sponsor people to come to our Hackfest, like the last one we actually had last week in, in Brno. Um, like uh, we even got, uh, like in the previous one, we got a couple of people from Arc Linux attending. Actually, this one as well. Um, and so, yeah, we truly want to be a healthy project there. And the Hackfests are awesome. Like uh, a lot of really constructive stuff always comes out of that. Um, yeah, of course, we participate in numerous conferences over the year. We, we um, attend all the conferences and try to make sure that everybody understands uh, where we are going and uh, can make themselves heard to, to drive it into the direction that they want. Um, we make sure that we always are present at the developer conferences that matter, matter like, um, I don't know, Plumbers Conference, like, like this one, um, so that people can talk to us and we can talk to them and we can ac 
kind of um, figure out what people actually want from this stuff. Our focus is uh, service desktop cloud embedded, like Linux ex itself, basically. Right? We don't focus on, on one specific part, and we are strong on those. Of course, as you might know, RHEL 7 is going to ship systemd. Um, RHEL 7 is like uh, most famous for being a server operating system. Um, it's relevant for the desktop. As you know, GNOME and, and these things like, you, like that use a lot of uh, systemd functionality simply because we provide a lot of functionality that others um, don't really do. Um, cloud the same, embedded, um, it's, 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 it's actually very popular in embedded. Like there are companies who do, do um, build it into to wind turbines and of course the car companies who build it into cars and it's built into toys and it's built into um, like uh, uh, telescopes that look into the sky and all of that already now. There's a question over there. Yes, I'll try. Um, I'll probably forget it in five minutes but then tell me again. Um, yeah, it has uh, more than three years of development. Um, we started it even more, a little bit over three years ago. Nowadays, it's uh, used in production. As soon, um, yeah, and we're currently working on including it in, in RHEL 7. So you'll probably see it on all your servers very soon, too. Um, yeah, so much about the superficial stuff, right? About the community things and how we, we do things and how we, yeah. Let's now focus a little bit more on the technical things. So one thing that is actually, I think, one of the most important things, it's uh, we believe that systemd is technically the right thing, the right design. Of course, it will have bugs like any software will, but at least fundamentally our design is right. Um, of course, you can only say that this design is right if you look at the other designs before, like there's, of course, a System 5 in it, which I believe, and most people probably believe at this point, is systematically flawed because it doesn't react to the actual things that happen on the system. Right? It assumes that hardware is mostly static, that um, um, devices like, like uh, hard disks show up at a very specific point in time and then are there and never change, um, and the ordering is very simplistic, I guess. Um, with systemd, all of that is not true. Um, we actually can listen to devices showing up, and when we boot up the machine, we will actually um, wait for devices to show up, run the file system checks on them, and mount them, and things like that. So um, yeah, systemd is about is this dynamic thing that can adjust to what's actually happening on the system, because system uh, systems work very different nowadays than they worked um, 30 years ago, because everything's dynamic, and you add this and that and everything like that. Um, of course, if you compare it to the other contender, which is Upstart, we believe that, um, I mean, the reason we initially created Systemd actually is because we believe that the Upstart design was wrong. A um, little bit about the history there. Um, we started, like, I played around with, with um, a, a little project I called Baby Kit. You know, it was back at the time where everything had to be a kit. Um, this Baby Kit thing was supposed to be like an experiment how we think that it sh should work. And then Upstart came along, and then I put that aside because we actually believed that Upstart would be the, the, the big and great future. Um, however, over, over a year or so, um, and after talk, uh, seeing Scott a couple of times at, at, at the Plumbers Con, we've eventually figured out that Scott's probably not giving us what we want, and we believe that inherently it had the wrong design. The reason um, what exactly is broken there is um, Basically, what Upstart does is um, you, have a, you have a language how you can express how events happen and what's supposed to be done that way. What Systemd does instead is um, you express relations between things. Now, um, one is a lot more, more um, flexible and powerful than the other, because in one thing you basically have the administrator figure out what should happen, or the developer, what should happen in which case. You write that down, and then Upstart will just execute it. However, in the system design where you have the dependency tree, basically you just say, these are the dependencies, and then the system will figure out what to do at what place. Um, this has a couple of effects, like for example, um, in systemd, if you want to have a minimal boot, you want to just start that and that and that, it's a relatively easy thing to do, because you simply look at the dependency graph, figure out what you want, pull in all the dependencies, and run it in the right order. This, of course, is systematically more, different, uh, more difficult with Upstart, because the after rules in the first place have to express what actually happens on the system. Um, this eventually um, becomes even more problematic. Like, for example, something very recent is the rearrangement of C groups. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have followed that. C groups are this thing how you can uh, attach a label um, to a set of processes and then um, optionally set a couple of results. Um, uh, 
values to it. Like for example, you can say Apache gets as much CPU time as MySQL, regardless how many processes um, Apache starts and how few MySQL will start. Um, and yeah, so with the resource um, handling with C groups, you suddenly have this problem that um, if you have multiple services which are basically should be um, handled the same way, you need to propagate um, certain things between these services, right? For example, if you have Apache and you have MySQL running in the same um, slice, as we call it, then you need to make sure that either both of them have CPU limits applied or neither of them. So, um, and this gets, gets more complex as there's an, an entire dependency tree where you have to walk up the the tree to the root and do enable and things like that. Now with systemd, with the design, this is very, very easy because we have the dependency tree so you can just walk it. And upstart again, this dependency tree doesn't exist and this, the, the, you, you cannot just do that. I don't know, I, I figure the, the upstart people will eventually figure that out themselves. But yeah, the summary of it all is, um, I can talk about that for a long, long time. I figure if you if you haven't looked at the details of what Upstart and Systemd do there, you, you probably can't really deal with much of what I say in this regard. But inherently, we believe the Upstart design was, and the System 5 and its um, design for, before it was inherently flawed at its core. It's not how we should do these things. We should have a dependency tree so that we can figure out all the right things. And yeah, that's the reason why Systemd was invented and that why we believe that it technically is the right thing. And none of the current contenders, other contenders can do that be them system five minute, upstart, open RC, or whatever else you prefer. Um, yeah, it's used as API by other projects. I know that some people don't like of that fact. But the simple thing is like the lower levels of the operating systems, they exist to provide services to applications making use of them. And that of course means that these applications need to use those things. Um, yeah, there's um, like there are a couple of different APIs, of course, PID once um, own APIs. There's a couple of other things like little mechanisms to change the time, to change um, locale settings, to change host name, these kind of things. Um, there's one little bit larger one which maintains user sessions, this kind of stuff. Um, it's all the things that we need nowadays and the desktop interfaces actually need to interface with. So yeah, projects use our APIs, desktop projects as much as server projects actually, because we have, in, have these things in there called socket activation. I'm not going to go into much detail about what socket activation is. Suffice to say, it's a wonderful technology to make your system faster, more reliable, and, and, and things like that. Um, so, but however, to, to make use of this kind of socket activation, you need to patch your project in a certain way, of course, and those are systemd APIs. Anyway, so, yeah, it, it's something why you want systemd. Of course, um, um, yeah, simply to make, um, to be able to run these things on systemd. And we actually believe that unification is a good thing. Um, of course, you can say it's a weird way to unify things by starting yet another project um, if all you wanted to make sure that everybody uses the same. But yeah, we believe that unification is, the same, is a good thing. Um, we don't need um, a thousand different implementations. Of course, while this is the worthy goal, we are of course quite far of that because, well, the most popular Linux distribution doesn't use it. But we still believe that, that um, it is helpful for application developers if they just have to focus on one API instead of thousand. Um, yeah. Well, then what's also interesting specifically for Debian is um, sometimes we push, or quite often, probably more than from any other distribution, we push Debian designs into systemd defaults. This can be various different things. Like for example, on many, many distributions, um, the way how the local host name was configured was uh, completely different. Like um, Debian uses etc host name, Fedora used something like etc sysconfig network or something like that. Um, and other distributions use, use something completely different for the most trivial setting of the system at all. And we looked at all of that and said, okay, um, if systemd um, uh, has to configure the host name at boot, then let's do that, but let's not support 20 different uh, configuration formats, of which 19 are completely moronic. Um, so yeah, in this case, for example, we decided, yeah, the Debian one, which just etc host name is the prettiest one, the simplest one, the most logic one. Let's just make this the, the default. Um, this doesn't mean that we immediately broke compatibility with all the other distributions, including our own. This just meant that, um, yeah, the Debian way, how this was done, um, was the best supported is the one that just works out of the box, but if people want to use something else, they can still plug in whatever they want. Anyway, so ultimately, we do that all the time, like that there are specific Debian choices or, or from other distributions coming into them. I think in a summary, we probably adopted more Debian things than any, from any other distribution. But yeah, um, so yeah, this might be something sympathetic. Um, Already, um, yeah, this is a different thing. Used everywhere anyway, like log any time that the local the host name the UDEF. 
Um, as it turns out, um, systemd, we, we had this little bit of a focus change. Like originally we started out as purely um, an int system, and then we figured out, well, during boot there's a quite a few other things involved, and we turned it into this basic building block to build an operating system from. Um, and then we added logmd, timedd, logald, hostnamed, I already mentioned them in udfd, we merged into that. Um, these tools are generally also used by other distributions, like Ubuntu, for example, recently adopted logmd. And uh, yeah, and uh, simply because them, the desktops like to use these th things and because they're sane and clean. Now, um, yeah, if uh, you use all that stuff anyway, you might as well just use the, the real um, thing, right? Um, if you look at Upstart like, uh, or at, at Ubuntu, how they, use, um, uh, how, how they use all the systemd components, they have all of these in there, and then they have a systemd shim even, so that a couple of the other APIs are provided. So I don't know. Anyway. Um, so this is about more like the technical overall things, but um, a big thing we believe um, why systemd should be default is simply features. Um, simply because there are a lot of features that we can do that, that nobody else can really do. Um, it's like hot plug, hot plug meaning like everything I already mentioned that is dynamic in systemd and you can, we can, can uh, run the entire boot up at the right time and then and, and spawn fs check when the device shows up and things like that. Which by the way is an actually an interesting thing where I also believe that upstart shows that it's a little bit too short in design. Like for example the, the phase at boot up which is like probably the most interesting part of this is where all the file systems show up, a file system checked and mounted, right? In a systemd model, we can actually express that with dependencies, right? We can say these devices have to show up, you have to run these file system checkers on it, then you assemble them, and that's it. In Upstart, um, they ship a tool called Montal, which implements that in C, which is, um, I don't know, it's chickening out. It's like we, they have this dependency system, like not, not dependency system, this event system, and ultimately it's not sufficient to actually make this very, very basic thing work. Hi, um, I'm the Upstart maintainer, by the way. My name's James Hunt. Um, Mountall is a helper application that, up, that Upstart makes use of to avoid polluting uh, PID1 with, with additional complexity or additional library dependencies. It does a fantastic job. It can express everything you've just, you've just described SystemD can do in terms of mounting with events. Yeah, well, SystemD doesn't pollute PID1 with that either. But anyway, um, I well, think it's, I it's, it's a bit of chickening out. You have this, this, this nice thing. Um, that that you can express out? events with, them, but you can't, can't even express the most core bit of it. That's something you do in a completely different binary. We, we, we run certain, certain helpers out of process. That's not chickening out. That's, that's to ensure system resilience to failure. Well, I mean, but you have already one event player. But anyway, let's discuss this maybe later. But it's like, I don't know. So multi-seed. Multi-seed is something that is in, uh, very, like, the core of what traditional Unix used to be, right? The entire terminal scheme that we have is something about multiple seats. Of course, mostly text seats, like you have a keyboard and a, and a screen, and that's about it. Like the other hardware you have is basically a bell. Uh, with multi-seat support that's built in the system, you get all of, all of that back, but in a modern way, right? So you get graphical stuff, and you get all the fanciness that we actually t tag through the device tree of, uh, of, of UDEF to which seat the specific device belongs, with the effect that you can have one machine with multiple seats, and then even if you plug in a USB stick or your sound card into one specific seat, it will only show up on that seat and not the other ones. Um, resource management, which I think is absolutely at the core of everything that service management is about. Resource management being that you can say that Apache gets as much CPU as, as Apache, or that you can pin, um, uh, um, I don't know, Oracle to one CPU and something else to three different CPUs, or that you can limit the memory of certain things. That's very much at the core of what administrators need to do about services. In systemd, all of that is built in. You have them as, as high-level properties. Logging. In the uh, system, the everything is logged from the first moment at, um, of the boot. Meaning like, like uh, if you use a system enabled in a just like we do in Fedora, Dracut for example, like Harold's Dracut, um, then you actually get logging the same way as for later services already from the very earliest um, bits of user space. And um, this is actually incredibly useful because usually um, it's the hardest thing to debug if your machine doesn't boot up because it hangs somewhere in the init already. So, yeah, and the other thing is, like, in systemd, every single service gets connected to, um, to, to the journal by default. I think that's um, true for Upstart as well nowadays, but uh, we had that all for a long, long time already. But anyway, so the, th the, the general theme here is 
everything's locked. Regardless, like as soon as user space is up, everything is nicely split up, um, nicely indexed, and ends up in, in, in the log files. We have ni nice things like watchdog support, right? Um, we believe it's inherently important for service management. If you have a, have a service, you need to make sure that it keeps running. And if it stops responding, then you probably should restart it. And on the same thing on the hardware is, like if you have hardware, like, like watchdog hardware, like almost all modern computers have, like even my laptop has hardware, uh, hardware watchdog, um, we should make use of that. In systemd, we have that all built in, right? There's a hierarchical watchdog support. Basically, systemd will watch your services while the hardware watches systemd. And it's in the, in the inner loop like, um, of systemd right built in. It's something that came from the embedded people, but actually on the other end of the spectrum, on the, on the high availability server side, it's also incredibly useful because that's how you actually reach your 99.999% reliability. Um, C groups, I think it's, it's kind of related to the resource management thing. C groups is something that um, nowadays um, is used by all kinds of things, like containers for by, by virtualization, like, like other kind of virtualization for service management and so on. With system D, it's built in, right? We use it in every possible way, which is really, really nice because actually services are tracked on the kernel level and we attach labels about which service it is to the processes and the kernel will actually inherit them natively inside. This has nice effects, like on, on a modern Fedora system, you can actually type PS with a, with a special parameter and we'll actually show you for each process to which service it belongs. Um, this is like, it's, it's actually in incredibly, um, well, it was incredibly missing from traditional Unix because if you had Apache, for example, Apache would fork off a lot of worker thread, uh, processes and those worker processes would fork off a lot of CGI scripts. Then you lost track about the, the relation of these worker process, uh, um, CGI um, processes to the original Apache because they could double fork and completely detach from the original session. With systemd that's not possible because we use C groups and everything like the definition of what a service is um, transcends the entire stack. From the desktop um, to the to the server is to services um, all the way to the kernel. Later on this will probably enable us to do all kinds of even more amazing things like hooking it up with a firewall and things like that. Um, yeah. There's really nice GNOME support. It's like um, all these things um, um, just work. Like the GNOME can currently log to, to, to the journal and have it indexed. GNOME can make use of these time date, um, host name D, blah, blah, blah. These things that I already mentioned, quite a few of other things. Um, GNOME is also very likely to move to system D as a session manager because much of the problem set that you need to boot up the system is actually. Um, equally useful to boot up the session. The problems are the same. You need to start a couple of processes in a short time and you need to wait um, for them to, 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 to happen the right time. Um, there's nice uh, features like FSS. FSS is something called forwards um, um, secure ceiling. It's, um, it's a technology um, um, like, uh, which is built into the logging system of systemd called um, journal. Um, it basically allows you to, that if your machine is hacked Right? And you traditionally have the problem that the attacker will try to remove, uh, the change the log files, like remove his traces from the log files, so that you have no chance to actually figure out that it was broken into. Um, the usual, the traditional way to deal with that is that you immediately log everything to a central log server. So if the attacker attacks your, your single server, then um, yeah, all the traces of that are already at the safe location um, somewhere else so that you can actually trace that back. FSS is supposed to be a, an, an alternative solution to that. Won't, won't solve the exact same um, problem. But um, it basically, with, with cryptography, it will make sure that um, through constantly changing ceiling keys um, that after the attacker broke into your system, um, he can change, he can basically delete all the log files, but he cannot change them anymore. Simply because the old keys that the stuff was sealed with um, are forgotten, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a very useful technology that just there in systemd. We have profiling and debugging built in, right? In system 5 init, most people used um, shell in a way or another to actually debug the system. In systemd, that's actually core part of what we do. Um, so, for example, you have interactive boot up. Um, we have um, a tool called System the Analyze, which actually, like, it can give you an entire dump of what the state is. It will give you output that you can um, put through GNU dot, or it's not GNU dot, but through that graph with thing that will show you the dependencies. It includes a boot chart implementation so that you can actually figure out what's actually slow in my boot. Um, and so on and so on. It's all built in and it's all accessible as APIs to applications. Um, 
Socket activation, I already mentioned that, probably not going to into much detail, but it's a wonderful thing to make things more reliable. It allows you to do things like, like um, um, restarting a service without having to close the socket, without losing connectivity. It does even stuff nowadays that you can sp can uh, have 20 containers listed on 20 IP addresses and ports, but um, instead of starting those containers right away, um, you can uh, totally delay that until the first connection comes in, which is a wonderful technique to drive up your, your density on the server, because you, have, uh, you can have a lot of containers and they take up very little, little, little CPU as long as they're not running. But uh, to, the, to the user side, it's completely um, invisible that they're not running, and as soon as the first connection comes in, they're automatically started. Um, security is built in. Like there's, um, for us, security matters. So in, in, in systemd, of course, everything that systemd does itself always runs at minimal privileges with no capabilities and things like that. But also for all the services, we provide really nice um, settings you can set. For example, um, uh, um, you can also say and change the capabilities of certain services. You can, you can adapt like you can make s directories invisible for services. You can make directories read only for services, um, and there's quite a few other things um, that are just built in and are made are made use of default. Like for example, in all of Fedora, we nowadays um, ship things so that every service gets its own instance of slash tmp, which solves a huge amount of security problems. Um, regarding slash TMP. So yeah, for us it matters that security is built in and it actually we consider it part of service management and not an optional functionality. Something, yeah, those are, these are completely random um, uh, features that we just picked. There's a lot more in systemd, actually. Um, so uh, let's focus on three more things that are coming up very soon. There's one of them is apps. Apps in a sense, um, having app images um, that are basically, you can run on every distribution and they will just work in a secure container, which we have been working on with the GNOME people. It's not quite right yet and will still take a while. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a, we'll integrate very closely with systemd simply because we believe much of the enforcement of the sandboxing needs to actually live um, in the kernel layer and needs to be facilitated by the lower levels of the stack and shouldn't be something that's just bolted on top. Um, of course, apps are something like, like we believe it's actually in, uh, important that if we do apps, we need to do them right so that they work through all the distributions and not just one. And yeah, so the next thing is KDBus. KDBus is something we have been working on for the last months and it's actually in really nice shape already, but not, not really shipped yet. Um, KDBus is actually a port of DBus into the kernel. Um, there's traditionally this weirdness in, in Unix that that um, most operating systems started out with a good IPC system and then lay, built everything on top of that. This is different with Unix because we never had a good IPC system. We had a couple of IPC primitives like FIFAs and, and, and then later on sockets, but we never had a real IPC system with massive call these kind of things. Like, I mean, they probably heard people around here, they probably are fully aware that the way Hurt started out was a very good IPC. Now, our approach to make Linux kind of pr have a one standard um, um, uh, API there for, for, for IPC is, is KDBus. KDBus basically translates the semantics that, that user space K, uh, DBus had into the kernel and it's, it is really nice design. If you're, if you're interested in that, we can mm, talk to you later about that. It's zero copy and you get, you get um, yeah, it's, it's really nice. It's, it's highly efficient. It's, it's even so good, you like, we basically open up. The reason we want to have that is this also for the app stuff because we believe it's like the uh, primary way in and out of the, should be the primary way in and out of the sandbox of a container. And it has policy attached to it and you can actually use it to not only do control but you can actually pass real data and these kind of things. It's a fun, fundamental step ahead. Um, yeah, KDBus of course is, is something that is inherently, the user space is inherently built in systemly because we use things like socket activation, share a lot of code and things like that. So um, it's unlikely that anybody but systemly um, systems will have this ever. Then uh, we work with the Wayland um, people. We have this login D, com login, login D component which already manages seats and devices attached to seats um, and sessions, things like that. Um, with the Wayland people, we have been working on making sure that Wayland, if it runs, r can run entirely in privileged, but then it still needs a component that can actually give access to the actual physical devices, the device nodes. And the way we do, like we, we came to agreement with the Wayland people in this regard is that LockND will just hand them out because it keeps track of that anyway. And the code to actually open this would be very simple and LockND is privileged and Wayland uh, wouldn't then have to be, which of course is, yeah, it's really nice for, for um, uh, robustness and security. 
Then we have integration with containers within our D and EFI, which are all kinds of nice things. Like uh, with containers, for example, we, we have defined a, a, a specification that most container managers nowadays follow, how containers can pass the UAD into it and a couple of other things. Like how they have to set up the environment for, for a system D system so that everything just works. Because traditionally, if you ran something inside of a container, you had to change the operating system first. Um, like we had to remove a couple of things of, of from FS tab and this kind of stuff and remove a couple of, of init scripts. With systemd, um, it is our absolute intention that things just work, right? So that we carefully made sure that, that, that on Fedora at least, um, we can boot the same image in a, on a bare metal or in a KVM and in a container and it will just work and always boot up cleanly. And there's integration with initRDs, which is something that we did for, for Dracut. Um, so yeah, you can run systemd inside of the initRD, which is incredibly useful. It's, it's, it's one of the results, actually. Harald is going to do a talk tomorrow about Dracut and about this uh, specific stuff. But um, it actually has this nice effect that nowadays Dracut is faster in, in, in transitioning to the host OS, like it, it, it shortens the, the overall boot time um, over the kernel doing it without initRD at all, right? which is an amazing result. Um, and um, it allows uh, in, it uh, in its systems to even do without shell scripts in the common cases, which is, yeah, it's, it's, it's how, how things become fast. Um, there's integration with the EFI bootloaders and things like that to pass performance data around. So actually systemd, I already mentioned that, has all these profiling tools built in. So after boot up, you can actually type systemd analyze and will tell you, okay, your boot up was slow because so much time was, uh, was spent in the BIOS initialization, so much time in the bootloader, so much time in the kernel initialization, so much time in the inner ID, and so much time in the system near the host. Um, so yeah, it's nicely integrated. Of course, all of this, all of this is, is the kind of optional, loose integration. So um, um, there are no requirements made or anything like that, and so systemd will boot in any case anyway. Um, we have integration with security frameworks. IMA, SLinux, Mac, everything that, that, that people want to use, um, they just work, right? And they're written in a way that, uh, that all the security transitions happen at the earliest, um, uh, uh, like policy loading, things like that happen at the earliest possible point so that every user space code that runs will only run with the policy applied. Uh, we have compre comprehensive documentation, like we have a huge body of man pages, and usually people um, figure that out, like, because most, most people say, oh, it's badly documented, but if they actually look, they will notice that we have man pages for almost, like, really everything. And we have um, a series of blog stories, and there's lots of um, community documentation, there's, there's even, like, articles and papers, whatever else you want. Um, and it's actually user-friendly. Um, since we have been doing development of three years, um, like for example, journal control, like you might, guys might have heard of the journal, like this logging fr framework of system D. Some people hate it, just the idea. But actually, if people actually ever touch the, the, the interface, how they can actually access the journal, which is journal control, they will notice it's an incredibly user-friendly thing because you can filter very, very easily. You can you get colors, you get auto paging, you get you get like um, separators when the reboots happened. Um, you get them, everything is just really nice to use. And, and most people who 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 automatically say, "Oh my God, it's an awful idea t doing binary logs and things like that." Soon, if they get into um, touch with journal control, notice it's actually friendly. This doesn't mean that people wouldn't have to learn anything, right? It's user friendly, but it's of course different from the stuff that was uh, there before. There's a certain learning curve. Um, there's a learning curve in everything. Um, we do believe, though, that the learning co curve for the, for the system new tools are, is much, much um, um, lower than, than the learning curve is for actually um, uh, dealing with a classic system 5 init script. Um, the thing, of course, is that people, uh, currently most people know system 5 init scripts, and system new is less known. So yeah, I w uh, you should try it. If you will figure out that it's actually much nicer. Like for example, it did, you see it in every possible way. Like for example, system control status um, shows you the current status of a service. Now the most interesting thing about that is what we believe is that you actually see the log output of that service, right? What is it good knowing that the service is still running if you don't know anything of what, what it's doing? Usually what services are doing, they log to the log files. So system control status will always show you the ta uh, last 10 log lines of everything it did. Um, so yeah, it's, it's incredibly useful. Um, you should really try it if you haven't. Um, something to say is um, we provide compatibility with um, System 5 to a fairly large degree. Um, I can't read that. 
Okay. Um, uh, we, we provide compatibility to a fairly large degree with 95%. Uh, There's 5% we do not support. And generally, those are init scripts that do weird things, like, for example, accepting additional parameters after the start thing on, on the system 5 init uh, um, command line, basically, which is outside of LSB. So our approach there is, yes, we w admit we are not 100% compatible. Um, very few things are, which are not system 5 init. Um, but we will document them in detail, and we can say, well, in LSB this was already not supported, so don't really have blame us. Um, the net effect of that is in Fedora, we currently have more than 80% of the packages converted to systemd, but basically everything that matters is con converted to systemd, and so this is really proven to actually work really nicely. Um, yeah, I only got 10 minutes, so let's skip this over a little bit faster. Unix or not Unix, I know that a lot of people think Unix is the only thing, the only religion that is worth living for. Um, I don't know, if you say it's not li uh, Unix, then I can tell you 10 reasons why it is Unix. Like, for example, I don't know, Unix means this thing that everything is a file in the file system. Um, system is that much more because we actually turn, turn all the services into actual file, uh, like they have representations of the file system and the C groups stuff. And there's a lot of other things. Like, for example, the, the multi-seed stuff is something, a truly Unix idea. It, is, it was built into the terminals that have been invented like um, 30 years ago. They kind of fell to the wayside. People only used them for debugging servers, but that was about that. that. We bring them back with actually native uh, multi-seed support that just works. So, yeah, anyway, I can give you some reasons why um, uh, Systemd um, is more Unix than everything that came before it, in a way. But um, then again, I don't think that the question actually matters, right? Um, sys uh, Unix for us is an inspiration. It's probably the biggest inspiration we have. But ultimately, our goal is not to be the best Unix. Our goal is to be, be the, to write the best operating system. So we look actually everywhere. We look to Solaris. We look to, to Apple, like, like MacOS. We look to Windows even. And if they have something that is nice, that people are like, then we should actually think about adding something similar to our stuff, if it's really good and if it's what people want. So, yeah. I don't think the question whether something is Unix or not matters. But again, I'm happy to fight this out with you if you st still believe it's not Unix. Anyway, there, there were, uh, I posted a blog story a couple of um, months ago about 30 myths about um, Unix, uh, about Linux, one of them uh, about systemd. One of them was about the Unix thing or not. Um, I invite you to have a look at that. So, the why not? Um, for us, Linux is what matters. That means, um, yes, it is true, we do not care about the portability to other operating systems, uh, meaning uh, FreeBSD or whatnot. We care about portability to other architectures, absolutely, but not about the other kernels. Um, yeah, this is, this is the thing that you get. The reason we do this is because we expose so much functionality that hasn't been ex exposed before, like C groups and, and, and all the properties and all these kind of things. Um, um, we can't do that if we wouldn't decide on which kernel. Um, because much of the functionality is simply not available on the other kernels. And I know that if people say C groups, oh, you could just use BSD jails, it's just complete bullshit. You can't. BSD jails are something very, very different. Anyway, so by, like, we actually have as goal to empower the administrator with all the functionality that Linux provides them. With. And that's a lot of stuff. And previously that was not visible because everybody tried to, to use the minimal set of Unix only, like POSIX. But POSIX is a standard that is by definition minimal and always out of date. So yeah, for us Linux is what matters. We actually want to give you the features. And yeah, the other thing is we work on one foundation of an OS, not on 100 different foundations. Um, this m means that we actually do remove options from time to time. That doesn't mean that, I mean, most of the times these options really don't matter. Like, for example, in Systemd, um, uh, we have nicer support for the Utilinux version of Getty than of any other version of Getty. Like, you know, Getty is this weird thing that just asks for a password on a serial or on any kind of TTY. Um, it's one of the most trivial programs in the entire stack, right? It just asks for a password and starts a session. But there were so many different implementations like MinGetty and so on. We just saying from the system side, okay, we ship you everything so that a Getty just works out of the box. If you want to do something else, it's up to you, can do that, this is how you do it. Go ahead, knock yourself out. However, we will only support like one because we think this one is the best one. And this one is, is, yeah, because it's a boring question. Nobody cares about what Getty is used because it's so trivial. So yeah, and systemd is not a ready product. 
right? System needs something, you have to build an operating system from, like you have to build Debian from, or Fedora from, or whatnot. It's nothing that will, it's nothing that you can install on an existing system will just work. It's not supposed to be. It's something like this basic building block and not the house that you can build an operating system from. And we are fast, yeah? There's the progress of system is, 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 there's a quick pace to it, right? We do releases frequently and we add new stuff all the time. Um, we make decisions, right? Because, um, I mean, often, frequently in open source, people are incapable of making decisions. That they, instead of ac saying, this is the way it goes, they say, oh, let's do everything to make everybody happy. We are not like that. We will make decisions. Yeah, our, f our upstream releases are focused on development, right? If you take the system thing, you get a series of releases, and they will always bring new features, usually smaller ones, uh, usually slightly, quite um, incremental, but they are not the versions that are ultimately stable. However, we help you with QA, right? Like, um, for example, we will um, adopt a system now that um, for every commit that we make, we will actually tag it with whether this is something to backport or not. The reason why we do it that way instead of actually having a stable branch like most other projects do is because this is, after all, this basic building block that you build an operating system from. It's not the stuff you install on top. This means basically that all the distributions have to incorporate it anyway, and they should pick a version they think is, is relatively stable, and this will, for all the distribution, usually be a different one. However, you want all of them have the, 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 the chance to integrate the patches. So instead of doing the QA entirely upstream, um, we will help you to do, doing it downstream. Like, for example, I mean, we support this now in RHEL 7, um, so we will have a lot of um, patches flowing into that. We will tell you that upstream, the ones where that we backport it, but most likely you're running a different version anyway because Fedora throws it, uh, because Debian throws it at a different time than Fedora or, or RHEL. And yes, so we do remove options from time to time from the base OS because we don't find them interesting, but there's always the, like, um, the, the, the chance to re-add it locally or, or do something else. Yeah, so you won't get everything you might want, but you will get a lot of it. And if you, get something, um, if you don't get something, we'll at least get an explanation from us why that is that way. And we will help you to find maybe a different solution or yeah, make, <coughs> try to find something how we can make this work. So, I already mentioned this, there's a learning curve. System D is different from System 5. However, ultimately, I believe the coming from zero, the learning curve to System D is, is lower, substantially lower than coming from System 5 in it, uh, coming from uh, going to System 5 in it. Anyway, this is my last slide. We're really happy about Debian's specific p p participation in the System D project, and we hope this will continue even closer than before. Most importantly, um, we invite the, the, the Debian community to, to um, contribute more and, and, and join um, the, the project so that system can actually be driven in the direction that Debian wants, right? In open source, it's generally the way that, that the people who write stuff usually decide more than others so where things go. Um, we want system to be this generic thing that everybody can use and drive in the direction. Currently, there are people from Red Hat driving, there are, couple, there are people from Intel driving in the direction, there are people from Arc Linux um, pushing into the direction that they wanted. Um, yeah, we would invite um, Debian even more than they already do to make it work for them the way they want, and uh, we'll make sure that we do the best, make the best out of it. So yeah, we want you in the project, and we want your influence in the project. And that's all I, all I have for now. Um, I think my time is over, but um, um, do we have to leave the room immediately? Otherwise, we could still do questions. Okay, then let's do a couple of questions. I see somebody um, um, raising his arm. Should be. Um, I was just saying thank you, Leonard, for all your body of work on System D and everything. And my question is, when I've tried System D and ran into a failure mode where the system wouldn't boot and would say hang with a blank screen or without much information, you can go off and look at the wiki and see various workarounds to figure out the bug. But the, all these workarounds seem like things that a inexperienced system in might have trouble with, say, if they were my mom being helped over the phone with a problem. So is there any work when getting System D to boot to, say, 
a root shell if it's booted with an emergency parameter or something and always work and be able to let you debug it. So in general, uh, that's what happens actually, right? You know, if you, if for example, a hard disk doesn't show up and we ha we we run into a timeout waiting for it, we will put you in a in a in a, in a shell. We will give you a little bit of an explanation that yeah, something timeout, please go into. The, You're like talking about the five the minute timeout. Um, yeah, there's, I don't know what the current time actually is. And then there, there will actually is a, is a hint given, now type journal control, and you get actually the logs. And what, what's nice again about systemd is that even if this happens in an RD, you get logs, right? Because traditionally, or if it happens during early boot before syslog was started, because in traditional Unix systems, syslog would be started re relatively late, and then only that, then you get logging, and before of that you were a bit on your own, and there were people scraping screens and things like that. Um, in the systemd world, it's, it's if we manage to, to detect the error properly, and usually we do because there are timeouts on everything that we do, um, then we also give you in one line when you got the shell, type this and you see what actually happens. And then you get the entire stream of logs from the kernel, from the internet already, from early boot, interleaved nicely and it hopefully gives you an idea. Um, of course, um, looking at log files is a nice thing. It's not always what people want because it's, it's, it's um, usually terse English language that people have a um, hard time to understand. We have a project there that to make this more, more, more user-friendly, which is um, the demons can actually attach a message ID to, to, to their messages. Basically, they would say, okay, if a sector is bad, the kernel could send a, a message ID for all messages that, well, which say that the sector is bad. And then journal control will actually already link that up with a, with a catalog entry, which explains in more detail what's going on and includes hints what to do. Currently, this catalog is relatively uh, empty still. I mean, there are basic text in there, but it's not, not, not super useful. But I figure as we go ahead with RHEL, this will probably be, be covering more ground. And in system, many of the errors are actually already qu equipped with message IDs. And um, so, yeah, I figure that, that over time, um, things will be much more nice in that way. Of course, we will never be able to catch all errors. Like, there's always things that you cannot catch. But... <laughs> Just mention it. Mention it, the debug and emergency. <laughs> so, um, um, uh, like, the, you, you, the, the thing is that, as mentioned already, uh, profiling and debugging and all these things are built in. And there's, um, you can boot with, on the kernel command uh, line with debug. Right, and it will turn on kernel debugging, it will turn on system debugging, it will, it will get a really, really elaborate thing on what's actually happening, like why system is starting that, and what's it doing now there, and things like that. So uh, tracing, profiling, debugging is all built in by default and easy to reach. And, and, and for example, in the debug case, because the kernel already used that that string debug on the kernel command line, we just hooked up a little bit more to it, so that people should actually be able to discover that without having to actually check the documents, if they are lucky enough to know the kernel debug option, of course. <coughs> because uh, Debian want to be the universal operating system uh, and there are now uh, other kernels coming, for instance K3BSD or is there some activity in the herd? Uh, and uh, there are uh, a lot of things, uh, so I do appreciate for the start to, to restrict on Linux, uh, on Linux kernel, but uh, is it uh, compatible uh, on the long term to or for uh, an operating system who want to be universal? So um, uh, I don't think that it makes sense to, to port Linux uh, system to other kernels. It's, it's not. I mean, we use so much functionality to make things really, really nice. I don't think, though, that's much of a problem, right? Um, if Debian managed to, to port the entire distribution to two different kernels, um, like you know, having two different kernels is way more work. Um, like because you have the uh, tool chain, you have to have the build uh, system and everything else than just supporting two different init systems. So my recommendation for Debian... Anyway, my, my recommendation with Debian would simply just... I mean, you have the System 5 init scripts and all the packages anyway, should, so just leave them in, and that's how you can support your other operating system. But honestly, I mean, it's, 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 it's not my personal problem, <laughs> those distributions, so I don't know. I think um, we, should sh we should really give people the chance to make use of Linux with all the functionality it has, um, and not, not limit us to, to, to a more minimal thing just because some people use something else. <laughs> So, so one point that you made, one point that you made in your talk, you you, you said that the uh, that that socket-based activation would allow you to improve oh, there. improve um, density d density for uh, containers. That assumes delayed activation. 
Now, one of the arguments that was made in, in discussions on Debian Devel is that socket-based activation is not intended to lead to delayed activation, and I think you can't have it both ways. Oh, you can. Either, well, you, you can't have it both ways simultaneously. Oh, you can. <laughs> either, either you are allowing delayed activation to enable, to, to, to enable your improved density, as you say, or you're spinning things up immediately, and if you have any kind of uh, high availability, any kind of service monitoring, your services have to, to spin up. You can't simultaneously have, have um, you know, the, the improved density from, from not having things spun up until they're needed yep. if you care about them being available and proving that they're needed. Because in, in any sort of internet-based service, the most important metric is time to response, not just whether or not you can get a connection. And obviously, delayed activation means you, you don't have you're going to have delays while things are being spun up. So my question to you is, do you have anybody actually using this kind of uh, density in production, and what is their use case for that? So um, there, there are a couple of people like who do do the service. Like there's, for example, a company called Pantheon, which uses a lot of socket activation like that. Pantheon does um, Drupal service, um, where they basically socket activates everything and start it as it's needed. Because they have this thing that you have a one-click um, 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 sign up on the website where you can say, I want to have my own Drupal service. 99% of those people never actually start it up, right? Or if they do, they start it up once and never do that again. So this is about, um, of course, if you do the delayed activation, then you can do that only if you have a very uneven um, um, profile about um, who, who uses what. But as it turns out, this is probably what most hosters have, right? Because websites are, yeah. Um, so it, in general, like like systemd, like the systemd services um, can have multiple triggers, right? They have can have um, a bus trigger, a socket trigger, a hardware trigger. They can be started at boot up, and um, systemd will will combine all that and spawn spawn things on the first one that comes in. So it's completely up to you if you use socket activation as a an amazing prioritization technique that allows you to drop all the dependencies between services, or if you use it as, as lazy activation to, to, to take benefit of the fact that people uh, only seldom use some services. Okay, thank you. Time's over. Okay, then let me say one last thing. Um, if you guys have any questions, um, we'll probably be outside there on the, on the green lawn and, and, and be happy to answer anything we have, uh, you might have. So thank you very much for your time. I hope this was helpful. <laughs>